this is a brief reminder on what we talked about yesterday. So basically, the problem we discussed was uh, first to de develop a, a, a generalized Cardi-like formula for su four-dimensional superconformal field theories, the indices of four-dimensional superconformal field theories, especially focusing on four-dimensional maximal super young mirror. And using that, I explained to you that we can understand some thermodynamic aspects of the supersymmetric ADS5 black holes, namely the known analytic black hole solutions of supersymmetric black holes in ADS5 times S5 in the large charge limit. Now we're going to be, now in the first half of my talk, we're going to go beyond this cardinal limit or large charge limit and see if the known black holes are all the black holes we, expe we expect to have from field theory or whether we expect more. I'll give two evidences that there should be new uh, large n black hole like saddle points if you go beyond this large charge limit. I'm not going to give a comprehensive uh, study of all possible black holes. Saddle point. I'm not going to give you a landscape, full landscape of this large n saddle point. I'm just going to give you examples that new saddle points are needed. I'll give you two illustrations. By studying a special sector of these 116 BPS states in which the known black holes collapse down to small black holes, horizonless, singular configuration. But on the other hand, if we do an analysis similar to what I explained to you in yesterday, we'll find, we'll appear to find large and some pseudo cardi like saddle points exhibiting macroscopic entropy. I'll secondly discuss the deconfinement phase transition at order one finite temperature. Uh, it's still hard to compute the deconfinement transition temperature exactly. But I try to argue that we can find an upper bound below which or at which the phase transition should happen. And that will lead to a prediction of new black hole-like configuration as well. Okay. Then I'll shift my interest, our interest to uh, supersymmetric ADS black holes in various dimensions apart from five and try to use the dual conformal field, super conformal field theory using similar techniques to understand the aspects. And there are many, actually too many subjects. So I, I'm not really sure how much I should cover. So if you feel tired or don't want to hear too much, interrupt me with your questions so that I can finish earlier. <laughs> so, but, but, but I, I, well, I was initially thinking of omitting the last uh, part on trying to understand ADS 6, ADS 4 black holes. Not many people might be interested in, but uh, I got asked by some people on these subjects yesterday, so it might be helpful to at least some people. So, so first of all, for even dimensional conformal field theories, dual to five and seven dimensional ADS, you can use some specific techniques existing only in even dimensional field theories, like Tufta anomalies and so on. So using that, you can make a somewhat universal, a more abstract studies about odd dimensional ADS black hole. I'll try to explain this first, it's nice. And then to understand even dimensional ADS black holes for odd dimensional CFT, you have to really understand some dynamics and do some dirty works. So that's the rough content. So, I'm gonna go beyond the large charge limit. Specifically, the large charge limit yesterday meant we had two chemical potentials for two angular momenta on four dimensional field theory. I took both chemical potentials to be small. That was my cardinal limit. I'm gonna deviate myself from that. Especially if the sector that I'm gonna study is, you know, to do the computation with me in my limited techniques, I still have to go to a very special sector. And luckily there turns out to exist a very special sector which hasn't been exactly solved yet. The special sector will preserve more supersymmetries than generic BPS operators. And if you have more supersymmetries, you generally expect that it's exactly solvable. And if it's exactly solvable, it, it often happens that the spectrum is boring. So I'll study some 1.8 BPS sector called the McDonald sector, uh, and some pe many people call it the operators uh, are named shoe operators, uh, and these kinds of operators exist. I understand in general n equal to uh, superconformal field theories, supersymmetric field theories, and just to explain you a general picture, uh, the question is the following: So the minimally supersymmetric local operators in n equal to Young Mills theory just preserves two mutually Hermitian conjugate operators. It's one Q and one Hermitian conjugate S. Okay? In the same notation that Shota explained to us in the morning. We can seek for some enhanced supersymmetries preserved by certain operators. And there, it, 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 essentially, there are three inequivalent 1.8 BPS sectors preserving four Hermitian supercharges, two Qs and two Ss. 
The simplest 1.8 BPS sector is called the chiral ring sector. So remember that this was a general 16 BPS operating condition. And when these two charges are zero, I mean, for, for certain operators, you call it chiral ring. At least in the weak coupling problem, this chiral ring problem is uh, completely solved using some cohomology reformulation. And it turns out that it doesn't show enough uh, number of operators to form black hole. The remaining 8 BPS sectors are perhaps less well known. Another sector can, one 8 BPS sector can be formed if two of the three uh, electric charges sum to zero. This is also a solvable sector. Uh, it has been solved by uh, Mandarx, Granarana, and later revisited by, uh, 10 years ago revisited by us. It's completely solvable. The spectrum is quite poor here as well, almost like as poor as chiral rings. The third inequivalent 1.8 BPS sector is obtained when sum of one electric charge and one angular momentum is zero. So I take this without losing too much generality. To the best of my knowledge, no complete solution is known, even at weak non-zero coupling. And I see in the literature that they are often called Shaw operators. In the, okay. the, the thing happens to be that uh, you can take a limit of the four chem chemical potentials in the index that I uh, explained to you yesterday to project the, the index to the, uh, the simplified one, which acquires contribution from states satisfying these conditions. Okay? So in order to project down to a configuration in which a non-negative charge is zero, you have to take a formal, partially zero temperature limit, projecting to states satisfying this condition only. So the partial zero temperature limit that I'm going to take is that one of the electric charges chemical potential and one of the angular momentum chemical potential are sent to infinity with its radio ratio fixed to be one. And the limit of the index that you obtain is called the McDonald index in a more broader context of four dimensional n equal two superconformal field theory it has been explored by these authors. If you just take that limit, you obtain this kind of matrix integral form. The limit can be taken within the exponent, the letter index, what you find is that uh, the, the, there used to be two denominator factors coming from two derivatives of four-dimensional field theory. You, after you make this projection, there are some bose fermi cancellation. So the appearance of second, uh, second numerator coming from the second derivative carrying J2 just disappears. So it somehow behaves like a two-dimensional index having one, one holomorphic derivative factor. It's called the McDonald index. And it's, it's, it's a kind of similar matrix integral form of n holonomies. I'm going to study a very similar Cardi-like limit of this, this large N index, by which I mean the remaining one chemical potential for J1 is said to be small. So in a sense, this is high temperature-like Cardi limit, but it's different from the previous four-dimensional Cardi limit in which only one angular momentum is said to be large. So it's more similar to Cardi limit. In case you get confused, let me call it McDonald's Cardi limit of the four-dimensional field theory. So clearly, it's deviating our, we are deviating ourselves from the previous four-dimensional card limit of the yesterday's lecture. And it's a new sector in which I find that existing black holes cease to exist. The known black hole solutions doesn't exist. But I find some new interesting saddle points here from field theory. Okay. So let, we, we should first study what happens to the an, known analytic solution for the BPS black hole in this sector. Recall that there was a charge relation satisfied among the five charges carried by these black holes. And what you do is to plug in this, this 1.8 BPS sector condition and massage it a little bit. After some work, you find that the charge relation with this condition supplemented becomes this equation. The first factor is manifestly positive, so this cannot be zero. The second factor is actually a sum of a non-negative quantities. The last factor is square of charge, it's non-negative. The first factor apparently has no reason to be non-negative, but if we recall an expression for the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of this black hole encountered yesterday, this is actually square of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So for the, for the black hole solution to make sense as a regular solution, this first combination also has to be non-negative. So the charge relation supplemented by the McDonald in that condition gives, firstly, the charge relation given by Q3 equal to zero. So two have to be separately zero. This is the remnant of charge condition, charge relation in the McDonald's sector. But we surprisingly get a second condition, 
that the horizon area of the black hole has to diminish to zero. So in this sense, the known black holes in the McDonald limit shrinks down to small black holes. There are some weak meanings in which we can regard this as a black hole, but clearly its properties are different from regular black holes we have been discussing. So I can sort of say that the known analytic solutions of four black holes, uh, uh, so the, there are no known analytic solutions for the black holes in the 180 PS McDonald sector. Okay. So had they been the most general solution, I won't find anything interesting from field theory either. But that turns out not to be the case. This is the McDonald's index in the, McDo in, in, the, in the matrix integral form. I take the McDonald's card limit, a kind of two-dimensional card limit, and the analysis is very, very simple. Instead of having two factors of Sinch functions in the denominator, I just have one. So I approximate this into n times omega or one or something. So the Cardi free energy obtained has omega one in front. This is the, very much like the two-dimensional card limit. And the numerator factors, this time, because there's only one over n square, you get a bunch of dilogarithm functions. And unlike yesterday's lecture, yesterday we had lots of trilogarithmic functions, and using their identities, you formed a simple cubic polynomial. Here, as to the best of my knowledge, you use whatever identities of Li2 functions in the literature, you don't get that simplification. To find the Legendre transformation of this quantity to study entropies and so on, inevitably you have to rely on some numerics, which is what we did. Okay. By the way, I have assumed the same maximally confining set of points in which all the gauge holonomies are equal to each other, so that the Polyakov loop expectation value can be maximal at the high temperature, uh, formal high temperature limit, small omega one. Now I'm just going to give you the result for the numerics. There's no way for me to do it, but I have brilliant students uh, who is especially good at doing pseudo-analytic calculation, essentially numerics, but he uses graphs, so it just gives me a confidence, although it's a, actually a dirty numerics. And then, so he gave me confidence that it's the right solution, and he, gave, he, he obtained uh, among my, Sun Jin Che, my student did this, and this is the numerical results. So the, um, as I explained to you, the chemical potentials are all get complexified, that has real part. This gets identified with the normal chemical potential and the imaginary parts are playing some important role as well. And uh, as I said, told you, the extremized entropy has also real and imaginary part. We only care about the real ones at various charges. So for simplicity of numerical calculation, I set two electric charges to be equal and keep one remaining uh, angular momentum and consider the entropy as a function of this Q-like variable, electric charge variable and angular momentum variable. In the unit of one over n square, I get a macroscopic entropy for the real, real part of the entropy. For instance, there are certain values of charges. So this kind of uh, numerical analysis strongly illustrates that there should be large on black hole-like set of points in the McDonald sector, even if the known gravity solutions predict nothing. So this is the new prediction, that there should exist black hole-like set of points in the literature. Uh, so black hole-like set of points, not in the literature. Good. Any questions so far? Yes, please. What? Why would you expect these solutions to be weakly curved? Weakly curved? So that you can find them in supergravity? <sighs> I'm going to parallel my, I'm going to give you some analogy of uh, this thermodynamic system with some numerically known solution called Harry black holes. Numerical Harry black holes in the supersymmetric limit are actually, I think, shown to have some, some mild singularities. So I, I don't think I can say I uh, expect completely smooth configurations. But the difference with the previous black hole is that its horizon area shrinks down to zero, while the properties of some numerical hairy black hole solutions, are the metric itself looks smooth, looks, looks finite, so you can, you can define the back Einstein Hawking entropy. If you turn out, start to take derivative, it exhibits singularities and see some singular tidal forces and so on. So I would still expect that since I 
have macroscopic finite entropy, it should be sufficiently smooth. I mean, the area itself should be well definable. That's, that's all I can say. Other questions? Good. And you have touches lots of properties like positivity of susceptibility and so on. So it really, it is at points really seem to make sense in the grand canonical ensemble. And so that, that's the end of my uh, first illustration. But there's another queer aspect of this sort of point that which makes me tempted to believe this is a kind of hairy black hole. So if you have a look at this electric charges chemical potential, it in, it's just a numerical result, but it's a very, very strange result. So, so roughly speaking, uh, this is playing the role of one of the inverse temperatures. And I plotted it at some macroscopic angular momentum in my cardinal limit. And, and a given angular momentum, I plot the chemical potential as a function of charges divided by n squared. The, the fact we find about our saddle point is that a finite maximal value of electric charges, the temperature-like variab variable diverges and turns to negative. So I don't know how to give meaning to this saddle point. So there appears to be, in the canonical crown sample, a maximal finite value of electric charge set by the angular momentum for which uh, the system behaves uh, well. Okay. Well, this is a weird thing. I, I don't know how to what the physical intuition of that should be. But a curious fact that is an extremely similar phenomenon has been found in a numerical hairy black hole solutions in ADS5 times F5. In the BPS limit, the numerical solutions, uh, in the non-BPS limit, these two authors have initiated these studies. And very recently, Santos, Marquez, Vichute, and separately by a paper by him last year, they studied the BPS limits. They found the non-BPS hairy black holes in which certain charge matters are condensating outside the event horizon, generalizing the known solution, and they took the zero temperature limit of that. If you go through this procedure, precisely the same kind of phenomenon happens. At given angular momentum, if you walk on the BPS surface, there's a maximal finite value of charge Q in which the temperature is positive. Okay? And if you approach this maximal, temperature, maximal charge Q, a finite value of maximal charge Q, temperature diverges to plus infinity, beyond which the temperature uh, behaves very, very strangely. So I, although this is a qualitative analogy, I mean, the mere fact that the two systems are exhibiting similar kind of exotic behaviors makes me sort of suspect that this might be another uh, kind of hairy black holes existing in the McDonald's sector. But this is a really wild speculation. Uh, we we'll need to be more quantitative to see if this expectation is right or wrong. Okay. Yes. So this is the end of the stu study of the saddle points in the McDonald's sector. Now I'll be discussing a little bit about the deconfinement phase transition at order one temperatures. Are there any other questions? Okay. So let me just briefly review what we have done, uh, what we have talked about yesterday. We talked about ADS5 Schwarzschild black holes, and we, 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 we have put them in the canonical ensemble at fixed temperature. And at fixed temperature, higher than a critical value, a certain value, there exist two branches of solutions, and we pay attention to the large black hole saddle points with positive specific heat. And the dominant saddle point has to be determined between the thermal gas of gravitons in ADS, whose free energy scales like zero power of F, N, and the large black hole saddle point, whose free energy is generically proportional to n square at order one temperature in the ADS radius unit. Okay. And it turns out that the, below the critical temperature, in the case of ADS5, uh, the, the, the graviton gas turns out to be dominant, beyond which the large ADS black hole saddle point dominates. And this is called the Hawking page transition between the graviton of gas and the thermal nucleation of uh, large ADS black holes. And note that in yesterday's lecture, we have studied the, the similar, we have encountered extremely similar behavior by studying the free energy of the known analytic black holes, non hairy black hole solutions. And we have found similar branches and similar uh, branches and comparing the large black hole branch with the thermal gas of gravitons, we have identified the, the index version of the Hawking page transition of the known black holes supposing that they are the unique ones. Now I'm going to investigate that from field theory. And again, we call the, we call the technical 
uh, puzzles that we encountered for the index of n equals 4 Young Mills theory. So the index of Young Mills theory again takes the form of this matrix integral with letter index. And I explained to you yesterday that a large end uh, technique to calculate it, 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 its saddle, saddle point behavior is to replace the integration of a large number of positions of identical particles on unit circle by the distribution function and replace this into a functional integration of this rho function, non-negative rho function defined on a circle. So the large n index takes the following form of uh, Gaussian functional integration. And depending on whether this coefficient given by this is positive or negative, if this is positive, it's the normal Gaussian path integration with, uh, with, with, with the positive coefficient. So it can be done at the saddle point rho equals to zero. So all rho is are zero, so it's a uniform eigenvalue distribution. And that's a critical signal for confinement. If you're gonna get a deconfined saddle point, what probably has to happen is that this sign has to flip, this coefficient has to flip sign to negative beyond critical temperature, so that some of this coefficient will want to condense, the Gaussian gets flipped. Okay? If that happens, that's a critical signal for the uh, uh, deconfinement. I mean, the confining saddle point at which all rows are zero gets locally instabilized. Okay. The puzzle we encountered yesterday was that at real fugacity, this coefficient turns out to be always positive. Okay. This was what Maldasena, Minoala, Chini, Raju found in 2005. Okay. I think, yeah. But I've explained to you that generalizing this setup by introducing an order one uh, phase uh, of the fugacities, we could solve many of the puzzles. Especially we were able to detect the large black holes uh, by introducing order one finite fugacity, of, uh, order one finite phases of fugacity. So uh, one can also think about generalizing this kind of analysis by introducing complex fugacities. Okay. Right. So this is the exercise I'm gonna do. It's a, it's a super simple exercise. So what I'm gonna do is, again, to simplify the setting, I mean, many of you get confused with many parameters, what is the temperature and so on. I block all this confusion by unrefining most of the chemical potential except keeping one, okay? So this omega is the index analog of the end of inverse temperature and x is its fugacity, okay? And this omega is conjugate to, let's say, q plus j or something, okay? Behaving like an energy. And this is really a stupid exercise. At real fugacities, you know, real fugacity is smaller than one. This is positive. So any, at any finite temperature, confining saddle points at which rho equal to one never gets destabilized. So index doesn't really see uh, the deconfining behavior. And the understanding is that had the entropy, true entropy, boson plus fermions become macroscopic, the de increase of the entropy will be very fast so that it will be triggering certain phase transition. But with this both fermion cancellations, um, you know, with less degrees of freedom, uh, this phase transition could apparently visible in the index could be delayed. With this purely real fugacity, we can regard it as that the deconfinement phase transition is infinitely delayed till infinite temperature when x is one, okay? Now I'm gonna obstruct this delay by obstructing the possible cancellation by replacing the, replacing the fugacity by the fugacity multiplied by the phase part. The simple strategy that I'm gonna see, do is to search for a condensation of the mode, this mode first condenses, by dialing phi deviating from non-zero, okay? And with complex fugacity, this coefficient becomes non-zero. We should be seeking for the instability by checking whether the real part of the coefficient is positive or negative. Okay? And most favorably, I want to maximally obstruct both Fermi cancellations, and I think the similar statement is that I want to dial phi so that the phase transition is least delayed, okay? So I want to dial phi so that the real part of this turns out to be negative at lowest possible value of x. Okay. This is the stupid form of the function. You plug in this and take the real part, mathematically gives you this. And I, <laughs> you know, it's a very stupid exercise. And, but function is complicated, so I make a two-dimensional contour plot of the real value of this coefficient. So this is the chemical fugacity, and this is the phase I want to dial, okay? 
And I first plot for you the curve for where real part of this X becomes zero. This is a, two, this is a red curve, uh, which is surrounding a two dome-like region. Outside, left side of here, real part of F is always positive. Inside is negative. Okay? So for instance, going back to zero, zero uh, phase, I mean purely real X, you find that there's no phase transition at all. So that this confining saddle point is always stable. You gradually increase phi beyond certain value, you suddenly see a delayed phase transition, a delayed instability at certain finite value of fugacity. Okay? You dial it till this point, you see the least delayed transition, here or here. Okay? So the least delay of the phase transition, the instability, turns out to happen either here or it's two pi ref uh, it's a reflective version here. Okay? And at this point, the least delayed transition fugacity turns out to be this funny number. So if you regard this as, sorry, as e to the minus one over something like this, this is the least delayed uh, apparent transition temperature, visible, apparent instability temperature given by the index. Beyond this, the confining set of points just get destabilized. Probably should be replaced by something else. Any questions so far? It, it's a very naive analysis. Perhaps there might be some loophole. I mean, I'll be happy if anybody can f point that out for me. But, 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 but I'm very simple-minded here. Yeah. So one can imagine about what can really happen uh, about the deconfinement phase transition. It might actually happen that the condensation of rho 1, uh, I mean, the instability of rho 1 will actually trigger a deconfinement phase transition precisely at this value, precisely at this value. And, 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 the uh, and, and, and for instance, in the partition function, not the index of uh, free young mills theory with matrix valued uh, fields, this is what happens. It has been analyzed by Aharoni, Minuala, and people. Precisely at the point where this Gaussian uh, coefficient changes sign, so that this wants to condense locally, phase transition happens exactly at this point. So this could be one scenario in, in which is realized in free field theory, but I think it's quite unlikely. More likely scenario could be the following thing. It could be that a new saddle point away from the confining saddle point appears below the instability temperature, perhaps still less dominant than the confining saddle point, and as we increase the temperature, the new saddle point will suddenly, may suddenly turn out to dominate at another higher temperature, still below our instability temperature. So be before the confining saddle point is get, gets locally destabilized. In this case, the phase transition is likely to be the first order phase transition. Okay? I mean, absorbing certain specific heats and so on, so the, the, the latent heats and so on. I think this scenario is likely because the black holes in ADS fives are really undergoing this kind of transition. If this is the case, to really confirm what is happening, one would want to find a qualitatively new saddle points away from our confining saddle points, but with my technique, I'm not really sure how I can do it. I feel this is a difficult problem, but somehow much more powerful people than me can do it sometime. But anyway, it seems that finding the local instability of the confining saddle point seems to mean that the critical, the temperature that I found is setting an upper bound for the true deconfinement temperature, <coughs> thus setting an upper bound for the possible Hawking page transition temperature. I wonder if somebody has some ob objection or not. Maybe I was sloppy or something. But this is my feeling. I mean, I think this is the most natural, uh, uh, na natural thinking that one can have. Okay. So accepting this, let's see what's the consequence. This is a plot I've shown you yesterday. The, the relation between physical quantities of known black holes with equal electric charges and equal angular momentum. It's the first ADS PPS black hole found in, in five-dimensional ADS5 by Gutowski and Real in 2004. So this is temperature-like variable. This is the energy-like variable. It's a large black hole branch, small black hole branch, and the free energy of the large black hole branch, small black hole branch. The point where the free energy of the large black hole changes sign is the, would be the Hawking page transition of the known black holes. Okay. And it would have been the Hawking page transition temperature of the whole system 
if these are the known, if this is the, if these are the all the known black hole solution, if this had been the full set of black hole solution in this system. Okay? But note that uh, this is the quantity that I illustrated to yesterday. But note that this temperature, inverse of this, is higher than the upper bound that we have just found. Okay? So this seems to be implying a contradiction. Had these been the all set of saddle points in this system, AGS 5 minus 5. So I think this is another illustration that a new BPS black holes of some sort has to exist, at new large and black hole like saddle points. And they have to take over the ground, take over the confining saddle point before the known black hole wants to do. Okay. Okay. And there might really be some kind of hairy black holes of the sort studied here in the literature. Precisely, they study the sector with equal electric charge and equal angular momentum. But for some technical reason, it seems that they only study the small black hole limit. Okay. And they only consider the particular modes of con possible condensations in the 10-dimensional supergravity on ages 5 times S5. So I'm not sure whether their setup will capture the predicted black holes at the point. But anyway, it's in the same sort of charge sector. Any questions so far? Good. Now I'm getting diverted to various different subjects. Um, 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 there are many supersymmetric ADS black holes in different backgrounds. Uh, ADS3 is a known example, but we have been understanding supersymmetric BTC4 for a long while. In higher dimensional ADS, we have ADS4, ADS5, ADS6, ADS7, due to all possible uh, superconformal field theories in higher dimensions. And they are all known BPS black holes with angular momentum, with electric charge, and some charge relation. Qualitative features are somewhat similar. So in three-dimensional case, uh, there are many studies that we are thinking of or actually doing, or some of them almost about to appear. So, so in three dimensions, there are many three-dimensional superconformal field theories. But the example that I want to discuss are the maximally supersymmetric conformal field theories in three dimensions. And we know that they are the field theories living on n M2 brains. So in the larger n limit, it has an M theory to or an ADS4 times S7. A strange fact, unlike normal gauge theories in four normal gauge theories in the, in, in, let's say, in the weekly couple regime, is that on strongly interacting conformal field theories on n M2 brains, it, is, it has been found from indirect, in various studies that the number of larger n degrees of freedom should scale to like n to the 3 half. So it's smaller than n squared. This is some strong couple phenomena. There are another mysterious class of conformal field theories in six space type dimension. It's also a maximal superconformal field theory. We call it 2 0 theory. It lives on, in string theory realization, it lives on the world volume of multiple M5 brains whose large n gravity dual is on ADS 7 times S4. The number of the light degrees of freedom on this, number of degrees of freedom in this field theory has been uh, found to be n to n cube, much larger than n square. Okay. And I'm not sure how many people know this. It's perhaps less famous, but it's found by Cyborg in 1996 that also five dimensional space time can host a lot of interesting superconformal field theories. The simplest example uh, in, in, uh, constructed by Cyborg in, from string theory is uh, living on n stack of multiple D4 brains probing some D8 brain and oriented pole system. The reason why you need this is to put these D4 brains in a strong coupling background so that you're going to get strong coupling conformal field theory. So this is a type 2A dilaton profile in the A brain background. If you tune this parameter, so that at the location of D4 brain, the inverse, gate, inverse coupling becomes zero, then at D4 brains placed at this tip defines a strongly interacting five-dimensional conformal field theory. This theory also has a larger ADS dual on ADS6 times S4 modded out by an oriented pole. The larger number of degrees of freedom here is also very weird. It has been shown by uh, ADS5, ADS6 calculation to be n to the 5 half. Again, larger than n square. For the first example, we know uh, various multiple uh, strong coupling Lagrangian quantum field theory description, starting from ABJM model and many others. For the five and six dimensional, higher dimensional conformal field theory, we don't have any known Lagrangian descriptions. We only have indirect descriptions or more abstract studies, such as bootstrap or so on. 
It has some, all of these have some relations to traditional gauge theories, but their relations are very, very indirect and subtle. Some of the gauge theories appear as effective quantum field theories after, the, after deforming this strong couple quantum field theory by various parameters. Uh, it's directly, this one is directly related to gauge theories, but always stays in the strong coupling limit. Okay. And a question that we'd like to ask here is that uh, it all has ADS dual, it all has black hole duals, and what does the confinement mean at all in this quantum field theory? Because all these deconfined degrees of freedom are very strange. Very, very roughly, one can say that the, the larger and free energy scaling like zero power of n is the confining phase. If it scales non-trivially in n, some positive power of n, it's the confined phase. Okay? But the detailed mechanism or aspects of uh, the confinement probably will be very different from the intuition we got from, from gauge theories. It's either more than n square, it's all restricted, or a restricted uh, deconfinement, smaller than n square. So hopefully by studying these examples in the setting I explained to you, we might get some hints or some on this kind of mysterious behavior. But we can, our exercise can shed more light on the detailed mechanism of this deconfinement and so on. So that's the rough picture I have, uh, which made me to get into these exercises. So, oh sorry. So I'll be, start, I'll be explaining to you three different problems. So, it seems that I have enough time, but I don't want you to be tired by discussing this and that example, so uh, I, don't, I was not really sure whether I should discuss all these things, but I'll try to mention everything at least briefly. So, the thing is that, I mean, you need to use different techniques to study all the cardi-like free energies in this example. The N equal four, four-dimensional young males at this stage, it turns out to be so easy that you have a matrix integral representation given from a free quantum field theory. The remaining three examples will be reasonably more, much more difficult than that, okay? in which free theory analysis is basically not applicable. But for six-dimensional conformal field theories, or more generally, even dimensional field theories, you can use characteristic aspects like tooth anomalies or so on, existing in even dimensional field theories, and to make some more abstract studies of the Cardi free energy. Actually, I, yesterday I illustrate, emphasized to you that the Cardi free energy that I got for four-dimensional superconformal field theory is expressed in terms of the anomaly polynomials for the tooth anomalies in the theory. So once you know the information on anomaly, it's quite likely you can, with clever analysis, you would be able to determine it solely using anomaly, uh, plus a little bit of extra ingredients. I'll ex elaborate on these stories for four-dimensional and six-dimensional conformal field theory. I'll be first rederiving the Cardi free energy using a more abstract anomaly-based discussions and try to apply the six-dimensional to zero theories. It will be more subtle to apply the techniques to here, but at least you'll get a strong constraint of the Cardi free energy, which I feel is almost a derivation uh, with, some, with some assumption. For odd-dimensional CFTs and even-dimensional black holes, you just have to work hard. And I'll try to explain what I'm doing with my collaborators. So let me try to re-derive the Cardi free energy of maximal super young males, four dimensions, to you. So you have to think more abstractly. So the four dimensional maximal super young males, I consider this index. Uh, if I turn off this beta parameter multiplied by E, you just uh, a turn off beta and give the relation, following relation for the chemical potential, then this becomes an index. So I, if I impose this condition and take beta to be zero, I mean, this will be the limit in which we can recover the index, okay? So it's good to, but it's good to keep beta as a regulating parameter because it's, it's, it sort of plays the role of the radius of the temporal circle. So with this re regulator kept, having in mind that we'll turn it off at the latest, last stage, we can express all the chemical potential geometrically as a background field. So know that our field theory was living on S3 times R. So if you put that in, in a background, you, if, if you consider this system at a temperature, you get a Euclidean quantum field theory on S3 times S1, where the circumference uh, uh, of this S1 is basically beta, twisted by many other dirty parameters. Uh, it's basically beta. Okay? And you're forced to consider the quantum field theory, Euclidean quantum field theory, on S3 times S1 with metric given as follows. So haven't there been any omega effect? This is the S1 metric with periodic boundary condition. 
and uh, theta phi 1, phi 2 are one of the standard coordinates of uh, uh, round S3. Effect of introducing the angular momentum chemical potential is twisting this metric by the following off diagonal term. The effect of introducing the chemical potential of the internal charges or R charges is turning on a background gauge field in the cartons of SO6, okay? Along the temporal direction, because these are all, chemical potentials are all holonomy-like variables on the temporal circle. Now I'm gonna take the limit, beta zero, and also the angular momentum chemical potential to be very small. This is strictly sent to be zero, and this will be taken to be very small. So if you consider this limit, you can regard this temporal circle to be very, very small, vanishingly small in this limit. So you can think of uh, in understanding some physics by reducing this system on small s1 and trying to encode some physics in terms of the effective action for these background fields, reduced down to three-dimensional background fields. Okay? So the high temperature effective description, meaning that, uh, can be encoded in terms of the following three-dimensional background fields. So you rearrange this metric first to make it a kaluza klein reduction along the tau circle. So you do the, again, do the new complete squaring and you obtain a met metric of this form, okay? You reduce on this, this becomes a weird form of three-dimensional metric. It's a particular squashing of the three-dimensional metric in a very ugly form. In fact, it's very different from the standard squashed three-sphere metric considered in the literature, but we are forced to consider this from the, from the partition function. You get a characteristic dilaton factor encoding the, basically the radius scale of this tau. And the off-diagonal vector potential appearing here, we call the gravity photon for obvious reasons. So the internal charges gauge vector potential is also decomposed this way into a scalar, scalar, fourth component, and a three-dimensional vector potential, uh, background vector potential. And I'm gonna write down various effective actions of this, gauge invariant, and, uh, 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 sorry. I'm gonna write down various effective actions of this form. There's some complicated story, but uh, it turns out that you can arrange infinitely many possible uh, low derivative and higher derivative terms of these background fields as an infinite tower of terms arranged in a derivative expansion, okay? And if you go to higher and higher order in the derivative expansion, defined carefully, it becomes a positive series in either this or this. Uh, so, 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 yeah, it, it, it becomes a positive series in either this or this, either both this or this. So it turns out that the leading term in the card limit turns out to be quite simpler to analyze. So, so, the, so these infinite tower of terms in by, of the effective action is expected to be generated by integrating out the kaluza klein fields of the dynamic, kaluza klein dynamical fields of the four-dimensional n equal four Young Mills theory. And since we don't know all the details, we can't compute all the coefficients. Okay. But some of the coefficients are easier to compute. These are the Chern-Simons terms. These are at the low, lower order of the derivative expansion, and it turns out that a specific set of chern simons terms are the only possible terms which can provide the leading Cardi-like behavior, okay? So if you can compute the 3D chern simons term in any way and evaluate it with our background fields, that will give another derivation of the Cardi-like formula. Okay, so that's my stretch. Uh, well, well, it, before sending it to zero and before imposing this condition, it, it satisfies a general twisted boundary condition. So you can just do the analysis there. Uh, if you want to study the index, eventually you'll have to set this condition and at the last stage there will be sort of periodic boundary, satisfying periodic boundary condition. But it's much more conceptually clear to consider the more general setting to avoid some massless modes and so on and take this limit at the final stage. Well, yes, yes, so, so, yes, so, um, I, I, I don't know if you remember that, but, but um, I, I, in the last, yesterday lecture, I wrote down the simple form of effective action in a canonical chamber when the chemical potential is imaginary part of satisfying certain range. So that canonical, I, I never said that in words, but it was written in my slides, so you can go and have a look. So there's a canonical chamber taking the form of octahedron and the boundary, if you cross the boundary of that chemical, chemical uh, the canonical chamber, the effect you effect mentioning due to massless fermion will change the form of this function to something else. So, but, so, so act, and actually the saddle point that we are considering is very near this canonical chamber, either slightly below or slightly above. But the fact is that 
even after you cross it, this, uh, this, entropy, this free energy turns out to be a con con continuous function. So no matter whether you're slightly inside or outside the canonical chamber, you get, a, you get a, basically the same expression. Okay? So yes, there is such an issue, but it's, it's no problem. Yeah. But for intermediate calculation, it's, it, it's better to stay in definite chamber for conceptual simplicity. Any other question? Good. So, Sean Simon's terms in three dimensions of background fields I explain, explained have quantized coefficients, and this can be often very easily com computed. If you have a weakly coupled limit of your quantum field theory, you can just compute it there. Because it's quantized coefficients, it's, 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 it's supposed to be robust under the change of coupling constant. Actually, we computed everything that way. But for the n equal 4 Young Mills theory, you can give a more intrinsic and, and, and abstract argument for that. So you can first list all possible Chern Simons terms, which can contribute to the leading Cardi, Cardi free energy. Surprisingly, well, not surprising, but, but at first sight, you might feel it's surprising, but there are two kinds of Chern Simons terms that we have to consider. First of them are gauge invariant Chern Simons terms of background field. So with our gravity photons and background three dimensional fields, we can have three kinds of Chern Simons, uh, well, three types of Chern Simons terms, where I runs from one to three, the cartons of SO6. There turns out to exist also gauge non-invariant Chern Simons term. You may be wondering what this means, but you clearly see it's not gauge invariant, so it's A wedge DA, but it's multiplied by a scalar. It's not the canonical gauge invariant Chern Simons term you see. The point is that this we are considering as a limit of the four-dimensional partition function on S3 times S1, and all the effective action has to re respect the four-dimensional Tufta anomaly. So in the four-dimensional partition function, the variation of the effective action is characteristically non-zero, and this non-zero value is, is constrained by the Tufta anomalies. Even after you take the high temperature limit, the effective action has to respect that, and the way this system it respects this Tufta anomaly is by having this gauge non-invariant Chern Simons term, whose gauge variation is giving the value predicted by Tufta anomaly. So you need a characteristic gauge non-invariant Chern Simons term. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's first noticed by Indian group and restressed by Kumagoski and Di Pietro. But for the n equal 4 Young Mills theory, this is a Chern Simons term that you get. It's completely determined by Tufta anomaly. Alternatively, you can compute it from weakly coupled Young Mills theory. Both ways, you get the same result. As for the gauge invariant Chern Simons term, you can either argue that uh, n equal 4 Young Mills theory has some discrete symmetry. So you can rely on some generalized parity invariance and SO6 file symmetry that integrating out massive fermions do not generate these coefficients. We can just compute and see at weak coupling. So the result is that. These three terms are not generated at all, and this is the only gauge non-invariant Chern Simons term. And this is supposed to be the leading term in the Cardi limit. One can show that other infinitely many sub-leading terms in the derivative actions are sub-dominant in this limit. We haven't completely proved this, but one of our, my collaborators, Juno Kim, is just good at computers. I think he investigated hundreds of terms. I don't know how many terms he investigated, but one day he came confidently, these are all zero. Okay? So this is very empirical. I think, I mean, I don't know, 50, 30. He investigated many, many terms. Those are re reported. I think this is strongly, strongly implying that all the other terms are subleading or vanishing. Okay? So we take this as a fact. Probably easily one can make a proof, but we didn't. So once it's developing this, this is supposed to be the leading term. We plug in our background fields and evaluate. We get exactly the same result. And the reason why you get a numerator given by the Tufta anomaly polynomial is because of this structure. This term is dictated by the Tufta anomaly polynomial. So it's clear that in the numerator is going to get this. Okay? And this argument probably will generate to generalize to many four-dimensional n equal one supersymmetric theories. Non-supersymmetric, I'm not sure, but we should think. Okay? So I re-derived the same result for n equal four Young Mills. You can apply the same strategy to six-dimensional conformal field theories. Uh, I just did it for two zeros for conformal field theories, but you, probably you can do it for one zero very easily. So here you consider the six-dimensional CFT more abstractly on S5 times S1 with small S1 radius twisted by chemical potentials. You do the same back game. You have three angular momentum here, and now you have two cartons of the SO5 R symmetry, internal gauge, gauge fields. 
And the gauge non-invariant churn Simon's term, again dictated by two star normally, turns out to be this. If you just keep two cartons, if you plug in our background field similar to the four-dimensional one, you get this one. Okay? Curiously, the leading dominant term is n cubed, dictated by normally, but there are some sub-leading order one terms which we ignore in the larger limit. There are again other gauge invariant churn Simon's terms, but unfortunately, as far as I can see, there's no I don't know of any intrinsic argument of forbidding this. That's, I think, because of the fact that the discrete symmetry structure of 2-0 theory is different from maximal Young Mills theory in 4D. Maximal super Young Mills has certain notion of parity invariance if you combine it with internal symmetry reflection. But 2-0 theory is intrinsically chiral. So I cannot use, let's say, some kind of parity arguments to forbid this gray photon terms and so on. So I don't know of any obvious argument that and I probably, I think these terms, some of these terms are non-zero. But there are indirect uh, evidences in the literature. Nowadays, there have been lots of studies on supersymmetric partition function of quantum field theories, including 0 theories. And I feel that there are some indirect evidences that, I mean, on different manifolds and so on, many things are studied. And some of these coefficients are argued or conjectured to be zero. Some of them are conjectured to be some number which is subleading in n, then n to the cube. So I boldly let us try to assume that all these terms, if not in zero, is one of n suppressed than the n cube. There are some indirect supports, but it requires a better justification. The reason why I wanted to assume and see what, see, see what happens is that just by considering this, you can account for the thermodynamic properties of large ADS7 black holes. It has been actually first found empirically by Hosseini, Christoph, and Zaffaroni early last year. If this is the Cardi free energy, uh, this completely explains the thermodynamics of large ADS7 black holes in completely the same manner we understood ADS5 large black holes. And to derive that, you have to make this assumption at this stage, but maybe carefully collecting the results in the literature, you may really argue that many of these terms are at least one of them suppressed. I was not careful enough to check all these things. So I claim this as almost a proof, but not complete one. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, what to say? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's due to my stupid normalization on gravity photon field. Many of the fields has inverse powers in vectors, I think. Um, let me see, let me see. Um, uh, yeah, maybe there's a conflict of convention here and there, but, 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 but the thing is that if you plug in the background fields, background field itself has some powers in beta, and all the terms, if non-zero, including this term, all the terms are behaving in the same way in the, depending on the Cardi factor. All of them become in zeroth power in beta. It's inversely proportional to omega one, omega two, omega three. I mean, if you make the notations concise and just do the calculation. Yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we, we check that. I mean, if these coefficients are non-zero, it gives the same order term with different numerators and so on. Okay. Other questions? Good. Now I have two more subjects I prepared. It's five-dimensional SCFT and six-dimensional ADS black holes. The last one will be three-dimensional CFTs and four-dimensional ADS black holes. Now one has to go really dirty and slightly braver than what we have been doing. First of all, I'll explain five-dimensional SCFT and their Cardi-free energies from certain indices on radially quantized, uh, from conformal field theories of S4 times R. Now, we don't have my, any microscopic description, so there's, so far there's no hope for, little hope for rigorously deriving any expression for the partition function, even if we restrict ourselves to supersymmetric ones. Fortunately, there has been lots of interesting proposal, which just works well, okay? So the index of this five-dimensional conformal field theory, I'll be exclusively dealing with the first example found by Cyborg, engineered on N stack of D4 brains, probing-oriented folds. But more generally, these authors, Hichal, uh, Song Su, and Kim Young, two of them here, has, has, uh, it's somewhere between proposal and a derivation, because it, Calculation-wise, it's, quite, quite, it's a kind of derivation, right? They got inspirations from five-dimensional supersymmetric Young-Mills theory, which are related to this conformal field theory by relevant deformations. 
And strongly inspired by this, and using some power of supersymmetric uh, localization calculus, they have obtained this kind of formula for the four-dimensional, five-dimensional index of the superconformal field theory on, on with some chemical potential. So the expression takes the form of the holonomy integral, very similar, to, uh, precisely the same as the holonomy integral we encountered in, in, in four-dimensional indices, but the integrands are much, much more complicated. In the four-dimensional gauge theory with free field theory limit, the integrand can be calculated to the free limit. So it's a platistic or multi-particle but particle exponential of a simple letter index which can be computed from elementary fields. Here is difficult, di different. They have been computing that the integrand consists of two, multiplication of two partition functions of five dimensional quantum field theory on R4 times S1. This R4 has to be omega deformed by this parameter. I'm oh, sorry, epsilon is nothing but omega one and omega two, the rotation parameters on four sphere. And these partition functions are called Necrosov's instanton partition function. It has a perturbative part. It has an instanton correction. It's the same kind of instanton calculus appearing in cyber weighting calculus that we heard this morning. But anyway, it's the full omega deform Necrosov partition function. And you, if you patch that in the Coulomb branch and integrate over it with hard measure insert and so on, the proposal is that it gives the, the index of the five dimensional CFT. It has been tested a lot with the many examples, global symmetry enhancements, and so on. So we can try to get some intuitions about deconfinement and large agents black hole from this formula. So you first take the so the partition function consists of two parts: perturbative part multiplied by instanton corrections. Perturbative part is simple; it basically goes the same way as four-dimensional integrand, four-dimensional young mills theory's integrand. The card limit of that is exponential of some letter indices, again, given by some trilobe functions. There are many, many of them because the quantum field theory example I discussed, uh, D4 brain, OA plane, DA brain, then these contains lots of matters. It's SPN gauge theory with one hypermultiplet in rank two anti-symmetric representation and some number of fundamental flavors and so on. So every matter that I just said gives one line contribution or something. But anyway, the structure is very, very similar to the the analysis, I, the, the results I've shown you for the four dimensional gauge theory. Instanton correction can also be taken this card limit. Then you get the free energy, uh, the, the pre potential of the instanton part. You, you know, it, this is exactly the limit in which you turn off the necklace of omega background. So it's a characteristic one over epsilon one, epsilon two behavior. And the instanton also takes this, instanton part also takes this form, except the fact that the instanton part of pre-potential is much, much more complicated than this. We even don't know the exact form. Okay? Here, instantons should be regarded not as tunnelings or so on. You know, since we have temporal circle, instantons I'm discussing here are self-dual or anti-self-dual configuration on four-dimensional spatial slice, or S4. Okay? So it should really be regarded as a solitonic stationary particle. And the, and, and, and the index acquiring contribution from instanton is counting the degeneracy of quantum bound states of these instantons and W bosons. Okay? So even though I know, use the note, uh, word instantons, you should regard this as some solitonic particles. Okay? Okay? And in fact, the, from the complication of the instanton partition function, you can see that there are infinite tower of BPS bound states formed by instantons and W bosons as you increase the instanton number and electric charge and so on. So if you really understand what kind of deconfinement is happening here, going not to n square but n to five half degrees of freedom, perhaps there are more quark-like ingredients, nobody knows. The imagination is that these instantons would be something like mesons of QCD, but in five-dimensional setting with more novel deconfinement mechanism. It's a wild speculation, I don't know what I'm saying, but that is the picture that I'd like to sort of develop or better understand by doing this kind of exercise. But still, I don't know what I'm saying. Okay. So, but that is the kind of conjecture that I'm having. Anyway, the structure of large and saddle point of this integral expression is very, very, should be very, very different from the four dimensional uh, uh, the, the saddle points that we've discussing. So the Cardi limit and large and we take both limits. We, we should first ask whether we can take the maximally deconfining saddle point. Let's say for UN, we take all the eigenvalues on top of each other so that 
at least formally some UN gay symmetry is restored. For SPN theory, you take all the eigenvalues to be zero so that all the SPNs are visible. Could that be the, could, could that be the Carter, Carter Settle point? Okay. The answer is that it cannot be the case just because of the mere presence of the instanton factor. Okay. If you just focus on, the, focus on the perturbative part, probably that may be the right saddle point in the cardinal limit when this coefficient is large, but the mere presence of instantons is obstructing this saddle point from existing. Okay. Had this been the case, it would have been very strange, right? You get to the maximally deconfining saddle point, you don't know what happens to the instanton, but at least the perturbative part will show n square, right? And the instanton part will go crazy. But something much nicer happens. So first of all, instanton part of the free energy, it can be taken a cardinal limit, but if you want to take the, all the eigenvalues on top of each other to restore the gate symmetry, instantons part of the partition function behaves very badly by having some diverse denominators uh, depending on the differences of, of these eigenvalues and so on. So if you want to put all the eigenvalues on top of each other to restore gate symmetry, maximally deconfining, the instanton part of the partition function diverges. Okay? So what this means in the saddle point analysis is that on the unit circle of this uh, variable, where alpha is something like some two pi periodic or so on, instanton singularities are not uh, providing certain repulsive forces pushing these eigenvalues away into the complex plane. Okay? So strictly sticking to this unit circle, there's no way of finding reasonable saddle points. So they are pushed away to the complex plane. So you have to find certain saddle points in the complex uh, plane, which is actually a cylinder here. Okay. So this is the line where the eigenvalues are satisfying this relation, unit circle. But if you take the, so in general, before taking cardinal limit, there are various singularities from the instant and partition function. If you take the cardinal limit, they're all approaching the unit circle. So that they really don't want the large and saddle points existing near their singularities. So they're spread, eigenvalues are spread into the complex direction. And in the case of five dimensional field theory we're considering, they're asked to spread in the order of n to the five, n to the half along the real line. Okay? So just because of the presence of this instant or solitonic or mesonic contribution, the eigenvalue distribution structure should completely change. And this kind of analysis has been done in a similar partition function of five-dimensional gauge uh, conformal field theories. Not on S4 times S1, but it's first done by Jeffries and Pufu on phi sphere, where very similar phenomenon has been found. And recently, I understand similar thing has been done on topologically twisted five-dimensional field theory on S1 times some four manifold. Okay. So technically, we are just copying what they did. And after this spreading, there's a little bit of more ma technical magic happening here, but I'm not going to mention that. The Cardi free energy after you obtain, that you obtain after this spreading effect can be computed, uh, and that turns out to be proportional to the n to the phi half divided by the Cardi factor and delta cubed. Delta is the chemical potential for SU2 R symmetry of the CFT. So you, this get, you get this kind of free energy with coefficient proportional to n to the phi half, you make a Legendre transformation of the similar sort that I explained yesterday. You're precisely accounting for the thermodynamic properties of supersymmetric ADS6 black hole, which I understand first was studied by David Cho some years ago. Okay. So quantitative studies are really marvelous. I mean, field theory is even ill-defined. I worked with well-motivated but proposed formula. There are certain roles played by this dirty mesonic Brown states, and only after that you get precise agreement with this simple formula. I don't know what's happening here at the moment. Can you take the question? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, for field theory or what? Oh, yes, yes. We, uh, so, 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 sorry, sorry for the bad, bad notation. I mean, um, we studied many examples, um, SPN theory and SUN theory, some antisymmetric matter. So depending on which theory you are, the, no order one coefficient difference. So we expressed it quite universally in terms of gravitational data, Newton constant and ADS radius. And its relation to the uh, field theory coefficient, uh, in coefficient, I mean, you have to recompute it depending on models, but we computed it and it completely agrees, yeah. 
So this is a bit novel, but, but I, I, want to, I want somebody to extract out what is the real lesson that we can get about five-dimensional deconfinement? Because, you know, I, I, want the, I want the deconfined degrees of freedom to be some kind of patterns of these instantons. These instantons are known to have very strange internal moduli, which some people tend to interpret it as uh, position moduli of some patterns of instantons, just like quarks are patterns of variance and so on. But I don't think anybody understands its precise meaning. So, I hope this kind of rigorous ca quantitative calculation gives some concrete light into some wild speculations, but I have little idea at the moment. Three-dimensional ones. Hope you're not tired. Okay. <laughs> I'm tired. I, mean, I, I discussed so many different things. So <laughs> this is my last example. I'll be very brief. I have to mention it because some colleagues in the audience asked about this question. I, I, I at least explain some qualitative features. So, in dimension three, the M2 brain conformal field theory, we are in a quite good situation. We have multiple quantum field theory description, which are argued to be dual in the infrared. So, by now, the most famous description is the ABGM description, which preserves some conformal symmetries and so on, and it takes the form of Chern Simons meta theory. I don't want to study the Cardi index in this setting because the form of the index is very, very nasty. This nasty form was found by myself 10 years ago, and I don't know how to use it to do any reliable, uh, any, uh, uh, any uh, easy Cardi limit calculation because of the following structure. Now in three dimension, the complication comes because if you're counting local BPS operators, you just don't find the elementary operators elementary fields operator. You have to find some non-perturbative operators or some kind of disorder operators that has been introduced by Kazia Yonekura this weekend. So here we call it monocore operators. On, on R3, you can define some local operators by giving singular boundary conditions of fields, creating some monocore flux. We collectively call it disorder operators, but this kind of operators has some singular boundary condition, so that's some um, some magnetic flux is created by this boundary condition. On S2 times R, you can consider it as some states in the background of some magnetic fields on S2. So the expression for the index, counting local operators, takes the form of unitary matrix integral, and the integral depends on the GNO monopole charges, which are quantized to be certain integers, and you have to sum over these monopole charges. If you ignore this monopole sum, sum contribution, just doing the larger and cardio approximation of this, I mean, that's inconsistent, okay? So, so the, the, the summation of these monopole operators are playing very important roles to see the strong coupling physics, even in the card limit. So, unless you have an alternative expression for this index, I don't know what to do. So I searched through all the other available quantum field theories for M2 brains, for which a nicer form of index exists. A second alternative quantum field theory that you might think of using is the maximally supersymmetric Young Mills theory in three, in three dimensions. Let's say it's given by UN Young Mills theory. It has maximal supersymmetry. And this is just a field theory living on a stack of D2 brains. It's a super renormalizable theory. So in the infrared, it, it, it flows to a strongly interacting theory. This algae flow from M theory perspective corresponds to decompactifying the M theory circle. So we expect that this infrared strong coupling fixed point will be the wall volume theory on M2 brains. Okay? So we expect there to be an infrared fixed point for M2 brain CFT, but so for some reason it's very, very hard to use this quantum field theory to do non-trivial quantum calculations. So I won't use this. There are some technical reasons for that, but I won't use this. I use a cousin of this kind of gauge theory, a third version of it, for some stupid reason we call for some sophisticated reason, we call it the mirror dual of maximal superior. Sorry. Uh, since, yeah, we just call it. But physically, it's engineered by not just considering ND2 brains, but letting ND2 brains to probe a single D6 brain in flat space. Okay? And in the infrared, we expect from string theory that this theory will flow to the same infrared fixed point as this one and this one. The rough reason is the following. Again, the algae flow is realized as decompactifying the M-theory circle. And if you decompactify the M-theory circle, D6 brain is uplifting to Taubner space. 
And the tau knob space with single center at infinite radius is just flat space. So the strong coupling limit of M theory gives just n stack of M2 brains in flat space. So we expect this system, uh, which in fact has reduced supersymmetry in UV, will flow to the same superconformal fixed point with maximal supercharges. I'm going to use this model to do some uh, handicap, well, some reasonably handier calculations. It is a UN gauge theory with the maximal super young mill field content, but it's broken to half supersymmetry, n equal four supersymmetries, by introducing one fundamental hypermultiplex coming from D2, D6 string. This theory has a characteristic feature that it has a Higgs branch. The Higgs branch in D2, D6 system is where the D2 gets dissolved into D6, like the young mills instantons. So it has a Higgs branch. And if you suitably deform this system with Higgs branch, you get some vortex soliton. And in the case we know that vortex solitons, in, in, in models in which vortex solitons exist, it often has been developed that this, this index of conformal field theory gets factorized into products of vortex partition functions. So if I can compute the larger and Cardi-like behavior of vortex partition functions, I may think of using it to compute the Cardi behavior of this without using this monopole formula. I mean, vortex is basically monopoles, but the way that vortexes are realized in an alternative factorized formula is completely different from this. So that, that's the setting that, I mean, some, peop, some people ask about this calculation privately, so I spent some time to say. So this is the Higgs branch. Oh, I'm running out of time. So this is the Higgs branch. It's basically the U1 instant of moduli space equation. You can get Higgs branch and you can form some vortices and you can define some vortex partition function on R2 times S1 which is related to a partition function on disk times S1 with suitable boundary condition, for which, thanks to the work of Yoshida and Sugiyama, we have a nice contra-integral expression for the vortex partition function itself, whose integrands are now given by the infinite Pokama symbol. So using a technique fairly similar to that I have explained for the case of five-dimensional field theory and so on, you can do a large end saddle point calculation of the Cardi free energy. There are many subtleties here, actually the project is way more difficult than five dimension. But anyway, we can do some calculation of the Cardi free energy and use the factorization formula of the conformal field theory index into vortex partition functions, which we separately developed based on the earlier works. This work and another work by Dimovde, Pasquetti, and Beam. And the result is roughly speaking that we get this kind of Cardi free energy where this beta is playing the role of small omega. And using that, we can account for ADSA four black holes uh, with certain technical complications which we haven't still uh, resolved. So from half a year ago, I keep saying that this is a work to appear, but it hasn't appeared yet because I'm getting more and more ambitious, I think. But anyway, this is the basic idea in which you can study ADS four black holes. So I talk too much. I briefly con con conclude. Any questions? I see all of you are tired, <laughs> sorry. So first of all, the important messages today is that by studying McDonald index and by studying the upper bound of the deconfinement phase transition temperature, I've been illustrating to you that beyond the Cardi limit, there should exist more black hole-like saddle points beyond the, the ones given by the analytic black hole solutions. And once you find one or two examples, I think it's a matter of time to find many. So I expect that the landscape of large and saddle points in ADS 505 will be quite complicated or rich, depending on your viewpoint. And I frequently I explained how to study the Cardi free energy of various SCFTs in various dimensions. For even dimension, I developed a method of using tooth anomalies and discrete symmetries to either constrain or derive the Cardi limit of the free energy rather abstractly. For five dimensional cases, I made a case by case study using some dynamical information and found some hints on the exotic deconfining behaviors of the field theory especially accounting quantitatively the dual ADS black hole. This is the summary of today's talk. Maybe a grand summary or propaganda of my two lectures could be that I think many interesting and very fundamental questions, and especially technically easy problems are waiting for us, so, and I don't have time to solve it now. So just, if you're interested, just come and grasp it. That's the end, thank you. Yeah, I have a uh, very naive question in the confinement of transition. Yeah. So usually, uh, it is a competition between energy and uh, uh, 
entropy. While here, you are counting only BPS, right? Yeah. So energy is a fixed to be zero, I guess. Energy is fixed to be a linear combination of positive charges. So these charges are playing the role of energy, and the chemical potential for these charges are playing the role of inverse temperature. So it's the mini, mini space preserving supersymmetry, but mm. they have their own energy life quantities and temperature life. Of course, in all these black holes, the Hawking, Hawking temperature for the black hole is zero. But so, so it's, in some sense, it's a kind of zero temperature quantum critical. <laughs> so could, could you briefly or maybe intuitively can you describe uh, what is basically changing between below and above? Below and above? Yeah. Below the transition temperature, the partition function acquires con contribution from a supersymmetric subset of gravitons. Supersymmetric subset of gravitons. So it's free energy of zero power in N. Beyond that, supersymmetric black holes are nucleated. It becomes a dominant saddle point beyond the transition point that, so that the free energy becomes n square. I see. So, so the, the, the animals which were uh, living uh, below still live uh, above, apart from the new black hole? Above the phase transition. It depends. Uh, if the phase transition is first order, the local saddle point might exist slightly above the transition, but in the canonical ensemble, it's meaningless. Uh, if it happens to be more degenerate phase transition, that confining saddle point will disappear. So it depends on scenarios. <laughs> scenarios for deconfinement, whether it's first order, second order, something between, something degenerate or so. Yeah. Any other further? So um, I got a little bit confused about your n equals four story when you derive it from a top anomalies because yeah. I thought there was a difference between the Casimir energy and the partition function. Uh, the, the Casimir here, energy, dif is, there's a difference between the partition function yeah. and the index, right? Here's the version which, which doesn't contain any Casimir energy thing. Um, this is a little bit hazy part. Yeah, yeah, thank you for this. I, I only have an indirect answer to this. Um, when I'm using more, some abstract high temperature behaviors, you should be questioning, you should be questioning, so, so, so if you try to compute the partition function from path integral, you know, whether you include the Casimir energy or not, I think depends on the regular, regu certain regularization stories that, that, that you employ and so on. And to get, to include the Casimir energy, which is supersymmetric Casimir energy, which is recorded in some literature, I understand that you have to employ a specific regulator in renormalization. And that kind of renormalization is breaking the periodicity of this holonomy in the Euclidean direction. You know, the supersymmetric Casimir expression itself is not a periodic expression. Here, for instance, if you want to compute all these Chern Simons coefficients by integrating out massive colors of Klein fermions, you know, there are infinite towns of massive fermions. So here again, you have to employ certain regularizations. I employ a regularization which manifestly preserves the periodicity of this holonomy. So I, morally, I don't give room so, for such bad quantity like supersymmetric Casimir energy to appear. I think it's a question of what kind of regula regularization you make. And clearly the regularization I make to microscopically compute it is different from the regularization that is made in the literature by Martelli, Kumagos, Wolski, et al. to get an expression including the Casimir energy factor. Uh, more technically, I use the regulator of D. Pietro Kumagoski to the, in the Cardi limit paper, which is slightly different from the regulator they use later to include Casimir energy. But since morally I include a regulator which manifestly preserves this periodicity, I think I forbid any room for Casimir energy factor to appear. That's my vague thinking. But still, the story, situation is not 100% clear. OK. Uh, we, can, we can talk probably more offline. Yes, yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But, but, but yeah, I only have limited understanding of this issue. I, I'm not very sure about it, yeah. Any other questions? Origin of the hair. How many? I don't know. 
origin of the hair, uh, for non-BPS black holes, there are explanations in the literature. Um, um, <clears throat> you know, it's really similar to this hairy black brain studied by Gopsa. Mm, uh, um, um, <clears throat> uh, when he wanted to study this holographic superconductor. You have some electrically charged brains, and in certain situations, the situation, the mass near the horizon is smaller than the bright alone of freedom of bound, so that, 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 that there was, if you have some charged matters, it wants to condensate, like Bose-Einstein condensation and so on. Similar mechanism is going on for non-BPS black holes, in which you replace the black brain into a black hole with spherical horizon. That, I assume, is the qualitative story for the mechanisms of forming hairy black holes. So if you decrease the temperature with given charges, Below certain temperature, the potential for charge scalar flips sign so that it wants to condense. The BPS limit of that, I'm not really sure. I believe there should be a better way of understanding how hairs are formed in the BPS limit, but that I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, if not, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Sokim.